everyone and thank you for bearing with us. As explained, um, technical issues are still very common and especially when we have so many people connected to uh, a platform like WebEx. Uh, we will try to make this presentation as smooth as possible. And what you're seeing here is um, the very first slides. So everyone is thumbs up, that's great. I don't know if I should turn on my camera, to be honest with you. I think that I could say, give you an hello, but if, as everyone is perfectly fine, I will do it without the camera and then at the end, maybe I'll turn it on, uh, just to avoid any uh, overload of the system. Um, so my name is uh, Jean Rodrigues Frade and I am the head of sector of DGP3 building blocks in the European Commission. I'm a colleague of uh, Michele and everyone else that is connected to this call here from the Commission. And I'm joined by my good colleague, Jose Manuel Panizo, also from Digit B3. Um, the objective of this presentation is to go more on the technical side and reflect together with you on the possible design of the digital product passport. Um, we have broken down our presentation in five steps. Uh, the first one is the introduction, because since we are talking about possible technical solutions, um, you might get uh, like the question, who are the people actually presenting these possible solutions? Um, I will explain. Uh, secondly, uh, we will, of course, uh, start by making some fundamental considerations about any presentation that tries to um, explain a possible design for the DPP. Um, we have to keep those in mind throughout everything that we will say. And then the way that we will run the presentation is around a user journey. We believe that the DPP should be as user-centric as possible. And the best way to start a discussion on the design of any solution is to understand the user and how we believe that the user will be actually interacting with the DPP. And then what we will do is to step-by-step step make some considerations on the design as we see it today. As I, as I said, this is a first set of considerations to start the discussion. But anyway, I believe, or we believe, it's good already to go into the more technical side and see what you think about our first ideas. I will finalize very quickly on the DPP storage, which is something that we have worked less, but we have already a number of scenarios that we can share with you. Um, so let's start. Um, first thing, who is actually giving this presentation to you? As I explained, we are from uh, DG Digit, or the Director General for Informatics. We are the technical arm of the Commission. It means that uh, the Commission has its own, um, let's call them technical people, that help the policy DGs to put systems like the DPP into place. I come from Digit B3, the Building Blocks team. I'm very proud and happy to be leading this team for quite some time. And if you Google my name, you will probably see that I'm involved in the European blockchain services infrastructure alongside the many projects that we are involved in. Um, but if you pay a bit more attention, then you'll see that I'm also involved in the once only technical system. I'm involved in the ICS2 system on the EFTI platform and many other systems. This happens because our main objective is to help the policy DGs reuse what is already available and do it in a way that piggybacks on the experience of others. So we work with all these DGs and different institutions and we try to promote the reuse of solutions and of course the reuse of experience. Uh, what we typically do is to help build an ecosystem around a set of specifications what it means in practice. It means that once we will have a design and we will introduce it into technical specifications, uh, and of course there will be legal binding rules on top, we will need to help the ecosystem to understand those technical specifications. And this is exactly 
what my team is doing in all these projects. We are te teaching, we are showing, we are helping. We are actually nudging as well because we do also monitoring and we try to nudge adoption. Sometimes we give tools and many times we try to actually use you know, the first movers as an example to drag everyone else in the right direction. We don't typically do policy apart from the Interoperability Act. We are actually more on the side of providing services on top of these lingo binding rules. Now, another part of Digit that you might know about is the Interoperable Europe uh, part, which I show on my screen, and they also want to help the DPP with data models, code lists, and serialization formats. We will not have time to address this part um, today. We will only talk about the generic design of the DPP, which is already not bad. Uh, so let's start with the first considerations. As I said, the DPP is a very important initiative of the European Commission that touches upon a full ecosystem. And therefore we need to think about the affordability of what we are designing. We want a DPP that is, let's say, as inexpensive as possible. And we have to consider how much, for example, SMEs can spend on the DPP relative to you know, their typical revenue. The reliability is extremely important because we will need to create a design that answers the needs of as many um, people and sectors as possible. So it must be reliable and it must be accommodating what these sectors already have in place. It cannot replace everything, of course. And finally, it has to scale. If we keep these three, uh, three no, four dimensions in mind, it means that we cannot optimize to one. So we cannot just optimize for scalability and then not consider affordability. We cannot optimize to reliability without taking into account, does it accommodate what is already in place? So this means that we have to keep in mind that we are looking at all these four dimensions when we talk about design and our choices must be driven by these four dimensions and not only by one of them. Okay, so then what I said continues to be true. What I will show you next is first considerations. It means that will evolve, it will change, but it is actually useful to help us create a common understanding of the DPP. So let's dive right into it. And as I said, starting with the user journey and then breaking down the user journey step by step. This is the user journey. The user journey for the moment is very simple. As we say over and over again, please take everything as an initial uh, draft for discussion. But let's imagine I'm in a shop and I'm interested in a product. And in this case, it's a pair of jeans and those pair of jeans have already been DPP enabled. It means that in the pair of jeans, I will find this data carrier that I can scan if I have a phone with a DPP reader. That DPP reader, once I point to the data carrier, will be able to show me some basic data about this product, even if I'm offline. This is very important. The data will come directly from the data carrier and it will be displayed on my phone for me to consult, even if in the shop I don't have any connectivity. In addition to that, what I will also be able to see are some links to the DPP information itself. So that's beyond the ba basic data of the product. That's the information on the so-called DPP document. Let's call it this way, which I will be able, if I want, to actually click and then fetch it from a DPP provider online. Finally, we also foreseen that the DPP carrier should contain some online control data that ensures that this is an authentic DPP. And we will explain to you how we see that. Fundamentally, I'm in the shop. I see my product. The product is DPP enabled. There is a data carrier. I will scan the data carrier and I will already be able to have some basic information about this product and the option to get more online. Let's say that I am online, I see the link, I click on it and I'm taken to a DPP 
hosting website where more information about the genes is available. I will want to download it. I see it on my phone. I'm very satisfied with that information and I decide to buy the product. You can see my smile um, on, this, on the slides. So let's now decompose this user journey and try to um, have a common understanding of the initial work we have been trying to do here. So on one hand, we talk about the DPP, but the way we see it is that the DPP should not be a monolithic data set. We should think about the DPP as a set of data sets, which means that on one hand, we will be able to use the data carrier to have information that is readable offline and use the data carrier also to contain the right links to information that is online. The information that is very basic and that is offline, uh, as I said, will be able to be read even if I have no connectivity. On the other hand, the links to the DPP itself and the control data will require me to have connectivity to be online. So keeping that in mind, what we also need to think is about then the security around the authenticity of the DPP. Now, we thought about two scenarios and two mechanisms to ensure the authenticity of the DPP. On one hand, we want to avoid that someone creates a fake DPP. And on the other hand, we want to avoid that someone takes a authentic DPP and puts it in a counterfeit. So those are the two scenarios that we want to prevent. On one hand, we want to prevent um, manufacturers to create fake DPPs. And on the other hand, we want the authentic DPPs to not be put on counterfeits, right? So let's then look at how we plan to avoid those two scenarios. Again, I'm in the shop. I'm happy I'm going to buy the product, but I'm interested to ensure that the DPP I looked at is authentic. One way to think about this challenge is actually to go back to the idea that I have the data carrier. I can scan the data carrier and actually through a simple API, I can contact the central registry of DPPs that is foreseen as part of the regulation and that central registry as a hash function that confirms that the information on that data carrier is indeed matching the information in the central data registry. Of course, we can think in a kind of more distributed way of the service, but the gist is we can use an hash function to confirm that the data carrier has not been tempered, has not been modified. And this is a simple, non nonsense, no nonsense type of solution, which would allow the consumer to know that that is an authentic data carrier and authentic DPP. Now, the other option, which is the data carrier is authentic, but put on a counterfeit. We know that there is a lot of information online by the different brands, by the different manufacturers and vendors about their products. So for example, I gave you the example of Liz Mills on a fitness company, actually not European, but some of you might know it. And uh, when I was buying their products, I could go online and check that uh, what are the differences between an authentic product and a counterfeit. Now, these links can also be included directly in the uh, data carrier, meaning that if someone actually copies that data carrier, they cannot change the information there. And I will be able to compare what I bought with the information online and know whether or not I'm buying an authentic product. So again, very simple way of ensuring the authenticity of the DPP. I, I go quite fast, so I'm going to try to summarize the initial design elements that we have been discussing and thinking about. Uh, we have the data carrier. The data carrier has three sets of data elements, basic data elements, links to the DPP data, and some control elements. The links to the DPP data will take me to either public data available to everyone or restricted data available only 
to a few authorities. Then, as I explained, there will be also control data elements that will give me more information about the product itself with this online counterfeiting information that many vendors already have online, so not something new, and those that don't have an incentive to have it. And finally, an hash function that confirms that the data carrier is indeed authentic. Now, we are going to go a bit more into the technical side. I hope for the moment you are, let's say, still with us and understanding the direction of travel. Um, hoping that this is the case, I will pass then the floor to my colleague, Jose Manuel Panizo, who will go into a bit more detail. So the first question that you might be asking is, what is actually this DPP basic data that I was displayed and that I could consult offline? You know, what is actually in there? So let's then look at a possibility. Jose, Jose Manuel, are you with us? Yes, thanks a lot, Joao. So we can see here an example of how this can work in practice. In part A, in blue color, we can see an example of this common minimal data set that is included in the data carrier. So here we can see that uh, we can envisage that in this minimal data set, we have some information regarding the DPP owner, product ID, additional product identifiers, information regarding the manufacturer, facility location, or product typology. In this table, we are also informing about the cardinality of these attributes and, and as some examples of how these prefixes will work. Later, we're going to explain in detail the syntax to understand these prefixes. As you can see, this syntax is going to adapt to current standards identifiers, for example, PIT, DTINs, or decentralized identifiers. The data, the data carrier should also inform about how to obtain the public and the private DPP information. I mean, a link between the data carrier and the online information. As said before, this data carrier should facilitate concrete instructions for identify counter, counterfeiting measures. For example, instructions on how to verify a physical tag that could be stamped in the product. And finally, this data carrier should also facilitate the verification of the authenticity of the DPP. For example, the procedure that we have explained before, by matching the hash of the information that is presented by the data carrier with the hash that is stored in the central registry. Next slide, please. So we have taken into the consideration that the, the use of these prefixes following a URN approach will enable a modular and also legacy friendly design because we are working with different domains that has their own business rules, requirements and concrete demands for the DPP. Some of them are even included in additional regulations or can be technical requirements, but also we are working with different frameworks. I mean, different standards that are setting the rules on how to identify products, economic operators, how to assign identifiers, how to express the typology of the component of the products, and so on. So the DPP should also cover requirements regarding concrete needs about counterfeiting information and how to verify the authenticity or, may, or maybe the validity of the DPP. So as you can see, we won't be able to define a solution that will fit into all. We need to establish prefixes to provide contextual information. Next slide, please. So let's go. Okay, let's go now in detail of this URM prefix approach. We support this model because it provides scalability, modularity, and flexibility to adapt to legacy and to future solutions. These prefixes they are going to enable us to support different identifiers and other claims from industries and standards, and they have multiple applications. They can, be applied, they can be applied to products, economic operators, or any other identifier. Uh, we see that this example of prefixes contain a list of rewards. First, the DPP to focus on the scope. Second, the type to understand and to identify the concrete rules that we are following in this identifier. And finally, the identifier of the product or the economic operator. 
this identifier has a meaning in the context indicated by the type attribute. We have usage here that the type will refer to different contexts like DIDs, BAT, GTIN, hashes, HBM, different industries. Next slide, please. So now let's go to the next challenge to solve. How to link the data carrier and the online information about the DPP that is stored in the decentralized data system. Here, the design principle that we have follow is to compare different approaches on how to store and how to obtain a link to access to the online DPP. Uh, we have started this analysis by the comparison of at least three approaches to manage this link in order to test and to evaluate before choosing. Next slide, please. To solve and I mean to resolve the DPP link and the information that is stored in the data carrier, we see from the regulation and also from the feedback from different stakeholders that the solution or the set of solutions should take into account the following design principles. First, it has to avoid broken links. As you probably know, it's very common that, for example, QR codes are printed and maybe there is a change in the domain of our server or maybe in the path of the content, it can change. And therefore, the printed QR codes doesn't work anymore. This will mean a high cost for manufacturers. We have also other, a second design objective. It has to be adapted to current and potential standards, industry rules, and the already defined business models. And also, it has to ensure business continuity. I mean, if a company terminates, it should be possible to establish the continuity in the provision of the DPP information. So for that, we are following a similar approach based on prefixes, an IURN approach. But first, we have to identify the different components that are included in the DPP resolution. First, the flow is starting from the data carrier, for example, a QR code. The user is scanning a tab, and then she obtains some metadata. This can include the information on how to obtain the online DPP. To ensure these design objectives, we see that the role of a resolver is needed, a set of resolvers, I mean. The resolver will be defined and established by the type attribute. And finally, this resolver will enable the user to obtain the DPP. Next slide, please. After some discussions, we consider from this analysis that at least we see three approaches. First, flat URLs that are offering HTTP links to the products. This, this storage can be self-hosted by economic operators or it can be provided by third parties. It has the problem of these potential broken links that is happening nowadays. Uh, second, we have a set of identifiers that has specific resolutions like decentralized identifiers, GS1 or ISBN. Um, it has the requirement of maintaining and managing a list of resolvers and how to conduct these endpoints. This service cannot be self-hosted. I mean, we need a third party that is providing this service. And finally, we have considered also the possibility of using IP, IPFS protocol for the storage. Without going into details, we can say that the content is self-identified. I mean, a hash is calculated before the information is uploaded into IPFS. And to this approach, we are offering additional protection to the content because we are providing some integrity of this information. In this approach, we only need a single resolver and the address by this content identifier. And finally, this, this, this service can be provided by the economic operator because the economic operator can provide the IPFS node or the service can be provided by a third party. I see some noise, but I don't know if we can move. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, we would like, uh, if possible, that um, whoever is currently not on mute, mutes himself or herself. Thank you very much. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. So, just to summarize the, the three approaches, here we can see that we are starting from an identifier, a URN approach, that is starting with the data carrier. This links 
as to the resolver, for me, DMS resolver, DIT resolver, DIT resolver, or HTTP resolver, and this resolver is enable us to identify the DP key, the online information. Next slide, please. Okay, so this diagram is summarizing the three approaches. We see here that there, is a, there can be a flood link that, for example, HTTP URLs that are connecting the data carrier to the online document. Uh, they can be based on the product identifier or maybe they can be a direct link to the information. We have also some identifiers, as we have said, that they have some specific resolution, like decentralized identifier. We need that deed resolver to obtain this information. We have also GTIN or ISBN that they need also a resolution. And finally, in the IP phase approach, we can identify the product, uh, sorry, the DPP information directly by a type of hash of this information, which is called the content identifier. And using a single resolver, we can obtain the information that could be stored in an IPS network. So now, just to finish, I will pass the floor to Joao. I think we are on time. Okay, very well. Uh, thank you everyone for bearing with us. Uh, final considerations about the DPP storage. Um, and then, as I said, I will not be very detailed. I will just explain the way that we are addressing this challenge. Um, we are actually trying to module some different scenarios. What you see is the tool that we are using. Simple, again, trying to model the scenarios. On one hand, we have to have in consideration what are the options for the data storage, meaning are we going to put, and we want, but on a central storage, meaning completely centralized, are we going to do it in a federate way, or are we going to try to decentralize as much as possible? Then we have to compare that with the way that we will manage the information that will be stored. And again, the data management, even if you, let's say, decentralized, you can still retain control by centralizing, for example, imposing a sort of certification of the actors in the ecosystem. So it means that you can have a decentralized storage, but a centralized way of managing the participants in that ecosystem. So that would be the centralized way of doing data management where we can create some sort of centralized service. We can also go federated or decentralized. So now we have this matrix and in each one of the different squares, uh, in this case, re rectangles, uh, we are able to create scenarios. And this is what you see um, that we have been uh, busy doing. Again, same approach as for the user journey to apply design thinking and to say, well, what if we go in the direction of centralized posting and centralized service? How would that look like? And what if, if we go purely federated? Um, so we started with these different scenarios to try to model as many as possible. And then we even went one step further, which is actually to start mixing the scenarios so that we start to approach the uh, challenge in a very, let's say, real way and taking it then to destyling all the interactions between the different actors that are participating in, let's say, this scenario. So this is called scenario modeling. We will not have time to show you and explain the full interpretation of why is this interesting, but of course, the next level is to start like considering all the elements that we could not really touch upon today, such as, for example, the access rights and how we can manage access that rights. Is this is not a flight, so I'm not, <laughs> uh, but it was an interesting prompt. So the, those are the, the, the elements that you see on your screen is try to bring everything together, including access rights, access to restricted data, putting the user journey and all the interactions we had already uh, that we have already discussed and then compare the different scenarios and little by little improve 
them so that we get to something that could be considered as matching the requirements of the DPP. So this is going to be quite iterative. We will not go to the we will not go into the fine detail today simply because there is no time and there is also a lot to digest already. Uh, so I, I will just conclude by thanking all of you. Again, you have my contact, you have the contact of Jose Manuel, but more, more importantly, all the slides will be made available. Um, and as I said, this is the beginning of the journey, not the end. It was really a pleasure to spend this last 30 minutes with you. And I pass then the floor to my colleague, Michele, so that you can also participate with some questions. I will stop here.